Welcome you all for this uh, dialogue uh, on diversity and activism. Uh, uh, this discussion has been organized on behalf of uh, Bharti Gyan Vikyan Samiti, All India People Science Network, uh, in association with Dhani, uh, Kansan, and also ISEC Student uh, Council. Uh, today we have four distinguished uh, speakers with us. Let me invite uh, uh, Shubhanka Chakravarti, uh, uh, who is uh, whose research mostly focuses on the evolutionary biology, uh, and currently he has been an executive member, executive committee member of the APSN, and uh, has been uh, associated with uh, activities of the Bhagyan Vikyan Samiti in Karnataka, based in Bangalore. Please, Shubhanka. that I thought to uh, focus today, many times when we are part of uh, All India People Science Network and People Science Movement, often this question comes that uh, what is this uh, people science? Because generally science is restricted to either our textbooks in the curriculum or uh, in this kind of campuses which are uh, fenced as well as uh, slightly more inaccessible for people. So it's like science has a lot of aura. But however, people science movement since its inception uh, is contrary to that aura, contrary to everything that we have known about science uh, in our textbooks. And uh, there are actually many people here who have been uh, associated with people science movement. Uh, so I mean, I wouldn't go in detail of that. but. When I started associating myself with people science movement in like, like four or five years back, I did see that there is a uh, there is a distinct there is a very important history phases of history of this people science movement. So the part that I want to emphasize is that the changing contour of the people science movement and how it has over time evolved on one hand and started to take up new challenges as it went on. So it, very quickly to go about it, it's like uh, after independence, I mean it has uh, roots much, beyond, much before, perhaps in some ways, because there have been people, uh, either Fule or Tagore, uh, who have tried to engage in critical pedagogy in different forms, uh, in different parts. Uh, but after independence, there has been an effort that there is a large number of people who have not been able to read and write. And the emphasis at that period in different parts of the country was that uh, for the people who are educated at that time or literate at that time to teach them. And that started off in various places in different ways. Like in Kerala, in Kerala Shastra Shaita Parishad, it started much before as well as in, it, it caught up in various different parts of the country in a different way. So over time, over decades, people started thinking about this that, well, it needs some sort of, uh, some sort of an engagement, a organized systematic engagement of the educators who are keen in inclusive education, Be, uh, whether they are in Assam or they are in Kerala or they are in other parts of the country. So, that led in 1980s for the literacy movement that government always ditched the literacy mission from the very beginning that you had this uh, whole Kothari commission in 1968 which we are celebrating like uh, right, uh, 1966 which we are celebrating 50 years now which already had at that time recommended the question of neighborhood school question of inc various inclusive measures that state should take for education. And education, by the way, it's just that, not that, you know, we, we tend to think science as severed, as something higher up in the pedestal as compared to the larger education process. And it is not, I mean, I'm sure that we all recognize that 
whoever like whoever is doing research in any of the space spaces present day, they have their own social histories. They have their own set of privileges. The the ability to go in school to get themselves educated. It's just not a question of meritocracy. That many of these kind of spaces often promulgate among us. So in 1980s, they, they there is a systemic effort for the people to go and teach, and they did it in a very colorful way. They somewhere just took uh, jathas, kala jathas, involved people, involved people in activity-based learning, uh, and that set up the whole uh, thing about Bharat Gyan Vigyan Samiti and All India People's Science Network. However, what what is what was to come at that time was a direct shift in policy, which is a which is when liberalization happened in 1990, early 1990s, and that shift was uh, was kind of thought about in the 80s. But what what had happened in that shift is that there was to come at that period states withdrawal from education, which much more deeply we are seeing now uh, in across the acro across uh, across India and uh, here as well. In fact, there is a institute, uh, there is a uh, NGO in um, uh, here in Bangalore, Center for Budget and Policy, and they have come up with a. And if you go on their website, they have come up with a very nice document on the condition of teachers. It's a recent, somewhat recent document came out in 2015. Condition of teachers in classrooms in Karnataka and Chhattisgarh in comparison to both, both the states. And many of the people uh, like Vijayas Karnataka and many of them who are involved in uh, with, with teachers, they do realize that it's, a, it's an abysmal situation in classrooms and in schools, which this report captures very well, which means there might be two teachers who are teaching in a school, one being headmaster and another person being a teacher, teaching four classes in the same room together. And that is what it is uh, now. It is, you know, not that every school has this only two teachers, fortunately not yet, but I mean, it, it is that there is severe uh, load that teachers are having. So, so these are the things that has come. So what happened that since 80s, when the people had this uh, interest and they have organized themselves for literacy movement, Post that, with the neoliberalism, they, there, there has been a very distinct idea that people have started seeing that there is, if there is a withdrawal of state for, from education, the fallouts are much higher and much bigger and much deeper. And what it is uh, happening now. So there has been a little change in focus in many, many parts. For example, when I recently have been to a meeting where um, there are people from uh, science activists from Rajasthan who have come. And in Jaipur, for example, they have been working with the, with the uh, women who are uh, divorced in an in area which is uh, largely Muslim dominated area. And one out of three women have been divorced in this area. Uh, so they started working some uh, eight, to, eight to ten years back with them. Uh, <clears throat> working on the question, of, like they, they they were doing searing units, and how it how it became a much larger space for them. So it's just not that science movement was talking about the question of science, uh, how we communicate science, how we popularize science. It's just not that. It also uh, very very carefully engages in the question of social <coughs> aspects. In addition to that. Partly what we are seeing, and that's what I suppose this uh, discussion is uh, hovering around, is the question of this diversity and uh, you know exclusion. Because all of us kind of tend to boost that there is like a huge diversity. And even the most unequal of nations, unequal of society, do tend to say that, oh, you know, we are being diverse in some ways. But within this diversity also, many times, if there is lack of affirmative action or lack of way how we look at uh, some institutions. What happens is that there is no, no one addresses the question of exclusion. For example, if we look at he here itself, like where someone was pointing out that, you know, it's like 
all male speakers, and um, and you know you, you do see that all male and upper caste speakers. So the point is that as long as we tend to very clearly understand that where we are, there are certain underlying social circumstances which is which are leading to them. Then only there could be a possibility of an affirmative action of any sort happening. Now, this affirmative action at this period in time, uh, and that's my last point, is that to what extent that we need to engage ourselves in this whole thing. Uh, for example, uh, you might be following this uh, U.S. election, uh, U.S. election that just happened. And many of the journals that I was seeing, including like Nature Methods, Nature, they ran editorials saying that, you know, this is what you have, you have to be knowing what it is coming up. So that means like uh, Donald Trump, President like Donald Trump's rhetoric at that time and how he views things. And same time, Hillary Clinton's uh, background and what she has been doing. There has been very strong writers. This some of these science journals were putting because it is going to affect society at large. What is much more interesting that I found, many of you might have read that in last, uh, I think today is ten, I think fifth or fourth. MIT had. There are, there, are, there are a bunch of faculties in MIT who issued a very interesting um, statement. And I will read out this statement for you, like for who hasn't uh, gone through it. It says that the president-elect has appointed individuals to positions of power who have endorsed racism, misogyny, and religious biology, and denied the world's widespread scientific consensus on climate change. Regardless of our political views, these endorsements violate principles of the core of MIT mission. At this time, this is important to reaffirm the values we hold in common. We understand the faculty of MIT at MIT thus affirm the following principles. We unconditionally reject every form of biography, discrimination, hateful rhetoric, and hateful action, whether directed towards one's race, gender, uh, gender identity, sexual orientation, religious, national origin, disability, citizenship, disability, citizenship, political views, socioeconomic status, veteran status, or immigration status. We endorse MIT's values of open, respectful discourse and exchange of ideas from the widest variety of intellectual, religious, class, cultural, and political perspectives. We uphold the principles of the scientific method of fact and reason-based objective inquiry. Science is not a special interest, it is not optional. Science is a foundational ingredient in how we, as a society, analyze, understand, and solve the most difficult challenges that we face. The last part that I found is very important and interesting is that for any member of our community who may feel fear or oppression, our doors are open and we are ready to help. We pledge to work with all members of the community, students, faculty, staff, postdoctoral post researchers, and administrators to defend these principles today and in the time ahead. So, the part that I found, I mean, uh, many, many people have written, I mean, there was so much necessity over last one year to write petitions that, you know, people have been writing, peti like, writing petitions and signing it, like, en masse. So, but what part that I found is interesting that this last part where they say that, you know, we, we place to stand by our, with our uh, friends, colleagues, peers, based on certain values. And that is what is, I think, is something that is quite inclusive about. So it does not mean that an institution like MIT, or for that matter, IAS, is, uh, you know, uh, has assumed a position where they can talk from top down that, you know, we are there and superior moral ground we have to look into these questions, which are structural social questions. But at least what it means to me as a reader is that there are people in this scientific community, in this academic community, who are showing certain degree of resilience to, so th th that has to be distinguished from the other part. And why I'm 
mention this because there is a very strong possibilities that we are seeing now that there is the, the people people are set part out at different levels uh, whether whether they are in their in their labs or outside wherever and that degree of per perturbation now seems to warrant certain collective action and it is important that while these collective actions happen we do have to take the question of exclusion the question of marginalizations more seriously than just talking from an empowered point of view the point empowered point of view of merit so it is in this context that uh, all india people science network had given a call nationwide for having a year long campaign systematically engaging both in the question of critical pedagogy as well as intervention wherever necessary and possible on the questions of democracy diversity social justice development so one of my friend was saying that but it has nothing to do with science then what is science i mean it's not something that has been boxed somewhere else that okay this is what is science and you know rest all is like whatever and that is also partly the reason that how we are we are viewing science now i mean if we do not question that then who is going to question this last point i want to make is that the reason that perhaps it is happening has certain degree of role of neoliberalism too as as its background and the reason for this being that over last you know 30 years we do see more of the aspect and focus um, kind of assertion of technology over science that many people do tend to discuss and believe that what they are if if they are using their their working in technology that they are doing science but there is a some degree of distinction that has to be made at 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 the both at pedagogic level i mean of course at pedagogic level and immediate you know um, immediate action level what what it is happening so if it is becomes if it does become more technology oriented if, if the technology replaces the ideas of science then what we would assume very soon is an undemocratic science and that undemocratic science is been they are in the newspapers in everywhere that you have like an awe about science using next next generation sequencing means you know that is something inaccessible for large number of people you are using uh, rocket science for example is one of the most undemocratic science in the country perhaps and because you know it's rocket so we rock this is not rock, rocket science what our lives are so surely like you know that rocket science is somewhere outside in the grip of people so science is just not again the population loops back with the question that whether science is essentially popularization of science helps enough for having a a situation of people science i i i presume and i believe that no popularization science is not enough for that but it is an important step but on the side we do approach these questions very systematically what is a democratic science what is an undemocratic science what what is an exceptionally science so i think that's where the people science movement across the country and particularly in bangalore this is a, this is a hub and this is a temple so we should we should be also the high priest who would who should put this views out uh, and uh, and that's why i feel that people science movement is going and uh, yeah with that i will thank thank you all stratification education uh, social theory uh, he has done his phd from jnu and uh, he has worked at jnu and also as a full time at ekalavya in organization uh, 
focused on innovative uh, teaching uh, in Madhya Pradesh. Uh, so I request uh, of <coughs> I made some notes and uh, although these are far too many points for me to possibly talk about, uh, at least uh, I look at them occasionally. Uh, uh, and by the way, any social scientists here? Well, that's nice. When I was trying to plan out what to talk about, and I was saying, I don't know what to take for granted, what not to take for granted. So, okay. Um, um, see, I uh, would be talking about uh, uh, the question of uh, the futures of public education. And uh, um, first thing I want to possibly raise is why talk about public education? Why should we worry about public education? Why not? What's wrong with private education? Most of us in India, most of us who have come over here, have studied most of our life in private schools. So why, why worry about uh, government schools at all? Uh, for that, uh, um, uh, perhaps one must keep in mind that uh, the character of Indian inequality uh, coming to IIC, of course, uh, most of our elite institutions uh, immediately uh, remind us of how unequal this country is. Most people who study in India, uh, I went recently to a state university and was reminded most people study in state universities. I don't know, what is the enrollment of our Indian Institute of Science? How many people are enrolled for, as students over here? Around 3,300. Okay. Kanpur University has about 5 lakh students. Uh, that's where most people study places like that. So uh, now uh, the conditions there and conditions here, it's a highly stratified society. Just look at higher education, higher education, highly stratified. But how many people get into higher education? So that further ex expands our understanding of stratification in this country. You know, the Ivan is talking about how many people at all get into higher education. Right now, it's probably somewhere between 20 to 25 percent of that age group. Now, which itself is a, a very small figure. That means one out of five Indians does not, only one out of five Indians goes to, to any kind of uh, education after class 12. Only one out of five. It's a country, if this is, you know, this we're talking about something like this, which is going to higher education. In that context, how does one try to visualize a system of education? Uh, the, one among the difficulties in saying that, okay, let the private sector take care of education. In Many people say that. And uh, perhaps that is happening whenever I think of this question. Uh, maybe the, the class that we come from, the kind of experience we have, you know, the way people who plan demonetization could not imagine what happens to the poor you know, when you don't have money. Uh, or cash floating, they could not visualize it. That was not the experience that they ever had. Not that they had bad intentions, not at all. At least I don't think so. Uh, some people think so, I'm not so sure. But the fact that the kind of social experience they're coming from, they could not visualize what happens to a vegetable seller if people don't have money in their pockets. What happens to a tea stall? What happens? And what has been happening for the last almost one month? That so that what's one of our basic ideas in uh, social science. My social experience affects my understanding. Uh, not completely, of course not. And uh, much of science, much of social science is about trying to transcend one social uh, location. Though perhaps we can never completely do that. But this strongly affects the way we talk about privatization. So what is we, our experience? And we are that very thin, very verified part of India. You know, even the most, more verified are the people who are, the people who are who has right now the power to do things about education in India. For them it is, many, for many of them, for many of us, uh, discarding public education is an easy option. <coughs> because that's not where our children are. You know, our children are not there. But the rest of India's children are there. One first question is, can we think of uh, public education or private education as a solution? Uh, 
the perhaps one of the great authorities to cite over and keep reminding each other whenever we talk about private education is what uh, Adam Smith had to say about private education. The um, Adam Smith, we all know, is one of the, the foremost uh, scholars ever to talk about the importance of privatization, the importance of the market. And it, he makes some very nice points over there. Uh, that uh, markets do help in many situations. But Adam Smith keeps telling us, not in education. Why? What happens in education? Uh, or rather, to be more precise, he, has, he says various things about education. He says that if you are trying to create a society where uh, 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 you want to see who gets education, uh, he says everybody should get education, only then can business prosper. If everybody is educated, then you get a lot of highly qualified labor. Everybody should get a good education. But can you give education to people through market processes? He is very clear, no. Why? Because one of the basic patterns of the market we know is those who have more money can buy more. So when you and I want to go and have lunch outside, those who have more money can go and buy more expensive food and probably more quantities, more than what we should be eating and throw away a lot of it also. But those who have more money buy more. When you translate that into education, it means the poor are unable to buy a good education if we have a market operated. Only the rich are able to afford an education which is of some quality. Let's, another question, what is quality? Now that's another issue. But if we start having the private model, the market-based model for delivering education in this country, one immediate problem which Adam Smith himself tells us <coughs> is that you will get a highly differentiated society where only the rich are able to get a good education, the poor are not able to get a good education. Now, are we okay with that? Uh, the, uh, we all know that India is a highly stratified society and uh, there was this American scholar called Myron Weiner who came and pointed out something very interesting about Indian people talking about education. And he was shocked. He begins his book by talking about how shocked he was. He said he went to different countries and everybody said, no, no, everybody should get a good education. He comes to India and a lot of people say, actually, he said almost all the senior people he meets say, why do should the poor get an education? Why should they get a good education? Should we really want, do we want to give the poor a good education? It's a very interesting difference. You know, why is it that Indians are talking like this and most of the world is not talking like this? Uh, it's very difficult to prove it, but many people have suspected that perhaps behind this is the culture of caste in India. It's a culture of caste system where it is fine for some to be at the top and it is perfectly alright for others to be at the bottom. These are things which trouble a lot of us and, and maybe uh, uh, the fact that we, we underestimate how much our social position affects our thinking. Uh, why is it that in India, we have, so many of us are fine with the fact that only a small number are getting a good education and the rest are not. Again, quote unquote good education. And there are, there is a very sharp gradient, there is an extremely sharp gradient. I mean, you just have to visit IIC to know how sharp a gradient there is. Or other elite institutions. The, the measures of those, there are ways of measuring how sharp a gradient is, this is. Here is one bit of figures, if you are like fond of figures. But uh, this is from NSS, uh, uh, which has a national sample survey with a more that covers more than 100,000 one, 100, households. Uh, what percentage of India lives on how much money? Uh, this is from 2011-2012, which says that 75% of Indians live per person per day on average. It's an average. There are variations in that. Per person per day live on less than 65 rupees per person per day. Now, that's 75% of India. I spent twice as much as that just driving here to come and talk to you, uh, which tells you how, as a, as a university professor, I'm not a particularly rich man, I think, but when I look at it from the, the scale, this scale, where am I? Where am I is another question, what about the rest? 
if 75% is living on less than 65 rupees, another interesting figure is 88% is living on less than 100 rupees per day. Now these are 2011-2012 figures. Today you boost it up maybe by 30-40%, something. But even then, uh, the advantage of such figures, such surveys is, it shocks us out of, pushes us out of our uh, immediate environment. It begins, one begins to ask, what is the rest? So, is, it, is this bound to happen? Many people say, look, this is life. You know, India is like this. We have to be like this. There's no other way. This is what, where we are. We are at the top and this is fine. But uh, is that true? Is that really true? For which, let me turn to my second major point, which is the question of, can we look at other situations, other countries, other times in the past, and can we learn something from them? Uh, what about USA? What about England? What about France, Germany? Some of the countries, all these countries, uh, most Indian elites at one time used to be surprised, now that many Indian elites have become globally mobile, they are no longer surprised to know that in all these countries, everybody, almost everybody, sends their child to a government school. And they send them to reasonably good government schools. All of our, our relatives who are in Silicon Valley and other IT firms, talk to them. They all send their children to government schools. And they are very happy about that. They are very, very good government schools. Not that, I mean, there are problems there also. There are all kinds of problems there. But government schools function. Government schools and people are happy to send the children to government schools. And of course, they can't even afford most of those private schools. They're so expensive. So we have examples of many countries which have been able to get government schools to work very well. Uh, how come? And why? How did this happen? For which a bit uh, a thumbnail sketch of history of education. Uh, Dhruv is there. He will say many more interesting things than I can possibly, but uh, uh, it's a thumbnail. Today, if we see that almost everybody is going to a government school in most of the developed countries, the, uh, uh, what was there in the past? So let's take the example of, that we take different countries are different situations, you can't generalize, but let me just talk of, say, for example, of England. Now, England was a colonial ruler, and uh, uh, perhaps one of the things we inherit from the British uh, is, this, is the problems in our far education system. Uh, but with that, I must say that one of the very nice things they did here, which they came here, you know, we all like to curse out Macaulay, we like to blame him for lots of things. One of the very nice things he did, not, it's not as a system that uh, one should not individualize it as a process, is that in, they helped create a formal structure where anybody can apply to get admission to an institution. This is not the way the caste system in India functions. We talk about reservations now. We've had reservations in India for centuries, which is caste-based reservations that you so-and-so person does so-and-so thing. The very act of setting up an institution, which is uh, what we call a meritocratic institution, in a formal way gets established in recent centuries in India uh, after the British come. So there are, they create a lot of problems, but they also bring some nice things. I just wanted to acknowledge that. The, uh, but okay, what happens in England? First, I'll talk of four phases in British education history. And see, can we learn something from them, even now? The first phase is uh, uh, where uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, like India at that time, education primarily being given in small pockets here and there by religious people. Uh, so you have the, some priest here who's teaching some children there, somebody there. Much of this is being supported by rich people in small pockets and by the church at some places. Let's call this a first phase. I'm simplifying, but it's a first phase. In this, like in India, as over there, only a few people were getting any kind of education. A second phase, we, uh, we see over there, which has been called by many people, it's called it, they call it an elite mass phase, which is towards the middle of the 19th century and actually towards the end of the 19th century, as recent as that, they said, no, no, everybody has to get an education. But who's going to pay for the education of the poor? So there is a 
small number of excellent institutions for the rich, the elite, and a large number of third-rate institutions for the poor. So by at the end of the 19th century, which is around the period by when the British finally get their act together, they are the slowest in the developed countries in getting, giving education to everybody, education for all in England really gets implemented at the end of the 19th century with this structure of a small number of good institutions for the top and a large number of very bad institutions for the bottom, very much like India is today. The British, the third phase, the British shift out of this around the night from the 1950s onwards. I'm simplifying, there are a lot of complications in modern. The really shift out of this in the 1950s. Now that is a very interesting thing for us. For us, for when we ask, how do we break out of our present situation? Uh, learning from other countries, nobody can generalize from one country to another, but some things one can think about. What can we learn from Britain or the US or France or Sweden? They all make this shift. The, I'm, I'm sorry, USA is another story, but many of the West European countries make this shift into saying that there has to be good education, not for the children of the elite only, but for everybody. This is the shift happening in the middle of the 20th century and in the second half of the 20th century at most places. Why? In England, there are several factors, one very important factor, and when we ask, when you ask, uh, what can scientists do about this? Why should scientists bother? Is when the elite academics of a country begin to start saying that this country should start giving a good education to its children. That's one, not the only, but that's one important factor which begins to happen in, in England in the middle of the 20th century, 1950s onwards. It's, it begins to build up 1920s, 30s, it gains a momentum and it starts to transform things in England from the 1950s on. That's a very important thing. Not just social science, not just uh, physicists and chemists, but social scientists, and in large numbers they are doing this. They are also, and which is the second other interesting thing, they are also getting involved with politicians, all these bad people called politicians. They are, they are getting involved with them. One of the great examples, I am from a I partly one foot in an area called sociology. So people often ask sociologists, what good are you? What, what are you? So our, perhaps the greatest example which sociologists give back, thing that we've done, the one great thing we have done, is we helped in this process in England. How? We helped in measuring inequality. And around certain centers, there were certain vibrant centers in, in uh, American, uh, sorry, in British universities, particularly Oxford, and around Nuffield is one of the important centers which the this. People start measuring educational inequality and start suggesting ways how can you decrease educational inequality? How can you, can you measure it? Can you decrease it? What are the ways of talking about this? Academics play a very important role in this. And amongst the other roles which they play is the generation of good quality academics. If we say, and one of the most pathetic, you have heart-rending stories which uh, we hear from India's government schools, where you have school teachers who are teaching maths but who can't do you know, three-digit multiplication uh, themselves. You ask them to, to, make, to, to calculate the square root, they don't know how to do that. Why? Here's another thing which academics can do. Create good teachers. If our college system is a disaster, where will we get good teachers from? If our college system, and we know the kind of college systems we have in it, and they are the people who are being recruited as teachers. How are you going to get good teachers if you don't have a good college system? Which is, which is in the first place, the first place they are learning something. Uh, Finland is often given as the example of a country which has some of the finest education systems of the world. And among the things that they do, they insist that a, a teacher must have had five years of college and university education. Five years. Good quality. Of course, they also do other things, which are also things for us to think about, that the salary of a, of a KG school teacher, KG school, the, the pre-primary school teaching actually, requires the greatest amount of skill and greatest amount of research knowledge. Uh, exposure to research is for that age group. They also give them a higher salary, slightly higher salary, 
than the assistant professor of a university. That makes it a viable career. People are, are not scared to uh, go into this career because the family will shout at them, hey, you're making so little money. So when one starts visualizing this system, these are many dimensional systems which one can learn from. We have to motivate teachers. We have, and part of the motivation comes from the, the larger, the salary structure of a country. It's, it, that if uh, uh, one of the sad things which has happened in India, post-liberalization, very sad thing. It breaks your heart if you once begin to notice it. Why is it that college teaching in India got destroyed as a career? You would have been reading uh, books, uh, novels in India, you would be seeing movies. Up to the 1970s, even 80s, young people like you would aspire that I will go and teach in a college. Today that has been destroyed as a career. Why? Driven by ideologies of the market, people began to say, why do you need to have regular college teachers? Give them contractual jobs. Give contractual jobs, it's not everywhere. At, at many places we still have decent uh, uh, service terms. But this idea that contractualization, privatization, let market forces drive labor, when this gets translated into how college teachers function, it destroys the viability of this as a career where at one point uh, 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 the brightest heroes of Indian films would say, oh, I'm going to become a, a, a teacher, I'll become a professor in a college. And people would, all the, the, uh, the people would say, what a wonderful thing. Today they don't say that. Today they say, I'm going to become an MBA. That's not just a random act. It's created by structures and policies. These are among the things we need to learn from other countries if we want to improve our education system and use our own common sense. What works in England will not work in India. We have to use our own common sense, but we have to, to, to look at these things. The uh, many more things one can talk. Uh, the, uh, the one important point you see I'm trying to make is, uh, trying to imagine alternatives is very important. If I can't imagine alternatives, I will never work for it. If I'm able to visualize that here are good things possible, I will try to do that. Right now, the only examples in our culture which we are being given are the examples of privatization and how privatization can solve all the problems. Uh, it can solve several problems. It can't solve several other problems. Building our understanding of that is useful and also beginning to visualize that what are the ways of solving those problems is useful. Beginning to, to be able to imagine those others. And for that, my last, I think, major uh, set of suggestions. Um, when you look at, the, uh, I've given a very thumbnail, it's worth your time to look at what other countries have done. One interesting thing, which uh, many scholars have pointed towards, is the role of, of people networking outside the government in improving uh, a very bad situation. This has been studied often in the nature of social movements. Why do social movements appear to be necessary to change a society which has deeply entrenched inequality? Now, I'm making two different arguments, two, two or three different ideas. I'm saying one, we have a society which has very deeply entrenched inequality, and it's such a deeply entrenched inequality that for the top, and we are most of us at the top. For the top, it becomes second nature to think that only certain things work. <coughs> and that apparent common sense is coming from our class location. And our, uh, not this class, our position at the top of a lot of things. Now, if this is so deeply entrenched, how does one transform this? And people argue that institutions can have very uh, deeply entrenched systems of power, which close our eyes to anything else. The example of uh, women's presence in science is a famous example of this. How women have had to struggle for, for decades and decades and centuries to try to get a foothold in science for which is, and to begin to point out how the, the institutions of science are fundamentally built to suit men. Not necessarily, this is not necessary. But the way these are structured are basically designed to suit the convenience of men. And how does one redesign institutions so that they suit both the genders? 
and perhaps other genders also. This understanding is not easy to grasp because we are used to a structure of power. We are used to a particular system. How does one visualize something else? Now that is when you have structures in which power is so deeply embedded. This is why uh, consolidations of networks which are stand outside the system are very useful. And uh, people again and again have pointed out that some of the most important changes in societies come when people who are slightly outside the system begin to network. Again, the, the Federalist tradition is a very good example of this, where people who are both inside and both who are outside begin to network and put pressure on this. They are able to, to consolidate themselves outside because they are outside. If they had been within, they would have been crushed. Uh, the, the point here is, uh, building networks is one of the most important ways of affecting entrenched systems of power and outside, uh, coming from outside the system. Uh, these operate in a variety of ways. People have studied the way social movements, some social movements do have a tremendous impact on society. Actually, if you look at all the major improvements we are talking about, you find a large number of them coming from outside the system. Uh, if you see the history of science, uh, very interestingly, most of the, the industrial revolution does not get uh, pushed from within the, the, the established institutions of science. Most of the industrial revolution is actually taking place from people outside. It's, the, the maximum amount of momentum is coming from outside. The way British science was operating at that time. So, the beginning uh, uh, to understand what are the possibilities, first thing is definitely if one wants to escape entrenched systems of power, try to figure out what are other sources of power and try to network those is, uh, uh, is a good thumb rule to follow and a good lesson to draw from across the history of uh, education across the world. The last couple of quick points, I am taking too much time. Among the things that we need to do is also to perhaps question public education itself. So far I have been asking, I have been defending, uh, asking for, a, uh, for us to protect and expand public education. But it cannot happen without criticizing it also. Uh, in, in the way uh, non-market forms of education have been operating, there are very serious, uh, very serious challenges. Uh, the market says that the way to solve that is to increase competition. For example, one of, the, one of the common problems of our education system is we have very uneven qualities of teachers. Some places teachers teach very well, some places, many places they don't teach very well or don't teach at all. How do you solve this? So the people who are supporting market say privatize everything. The market will make sure that only those teachers remain who, will, who want to protect their jobs, others will be kicked out. And those who don't perform will be kicked out. Now, the, there are very obvious problems in this. That if you want teachers who are only working to protect their salaries, that is not a good motivation for them to teach well. That's a good motivation for them to cultivate their boss. That's a good motivation for them to show results through all kinds of fudging. And that is, these are the experiments which have been tried out. It does not actually lead to improvement of the quality of learning. What are the ways of improving the qualities of learning? There is a huge amount of literature over there. One, just one thing I will suggest is, many people argue building cultures of excellence amongst teachers is perhaps one of the strongest ways of improving teacher quality. Where we built amongst teachers uh, cultures of commitment to their work, cultures of aspiring towards better understanding and better teaching. You will notice, this has only a marginal relationship with the motivations of getting more money. It's another kind of a motivation we are talking about. But this, a lot of studies seem to suggest that this is crucial in building better teaching. How does one improve government schools? How does one improve public education? Amongst the strategies we need to think about is if one is arguing that the privatization cannot be the answer, then one must argue that what are the other ways of finding answers we need to start theorizing this, in which another uh, of our sociological problems is that Indians are still uh, uh, in, you know, low down in the curve of learning how to build institutions. 
this is many people have pointed out to this problem of ours but learning to analyze institutions learning to how to build institutions how do you motivate people in institutions how do you give feedback these are all very important things for us to learn and of course most of this has nothing to do with the market these are other processes which we need to learn these are amongst the things which we need to internalize within our public school public university systems if we do have problems hiding uh, them and saying that no we don't have problems doesn't help it only gives the private uh, uh, privatization proponents more weaponry we have problems how do we solve them these are amongst the questions we need to ask my last very last point is amongst the things that we need to redesign perhaps within institutions is move away from our older model of thinking of learning as either you are brilliant or you are a duffer and these are fixed categories this is the way in which many teachers think this is the way in which many institutions think that either you are good or you are bad in contrast to this there is a way of thinking about people which is to say that people are highly malleable people are very flexible people grow for which you need to invest in people for which you need to put put in labor the classical model of teaching this is a british teacher pointed this out to me given the traditions of the labor movements in england given the tradition of enormous cultural shifts which led to uh, uh, this idea emerging in england that everybody should get a good education not just the elites that training sensitizes british teacher and she pointed this I, i never thought about it as good indian i never thought about this but this is what she pointed out she, she was observing uh, teaching in a classroom in, in several classrooms in a small town in madhya pradesh and she said you know your teachers teach in a very strange manner i said why she said they teach looking at only the best students in the classroom whereas we are trained to teach looking at the worst students in the classroom what am i trying to do as a teacher am i only picking up the best and feeling happy about that or am i saying that in this class there are students of different abilities different backgrounds how do i work with all of them moving to the second way of teaching is for us a great challenge perhaps because partly because of the caste system where we are comfortable with this idea that some are pure everybody else is impure perhaps we have other kinds of issues maybe we never thought about it but this shift is essential if we are to rethink the nature of of public education in india okay i'll stop at this point thank you all uh, another distinguished speaker we have ashwamandha Ashwamedh needs no introduction. He is a well-known activist and uh, analyst. Uh, he, earlier, uh, he has worked in the Indian Administrative Service, uh, uh, mostly in the predominantly uh, tribal states for two decades, and uh, is is the founding member of uh, National Campaign for the People's Right to Information, and he was also a, a member of uh, National Advisory Council. I welcome uh, Ashwamedh. thank you uh, i was a couple of months back i went to a, a district just close to taking a cold meva there were it was a week before bakri when some men in uniform uh, police uniform police men not not vigilantes uh, began to check whether the meat that was being sold on stalls was was cow meat or buffalo meat uh I learned that the Haryana government has actually created an entire police force headed by a DIG, uh, which is a cow protection force. Mewat is a very poor district, uh, and uh, uh, 
one of the, you know, there were 3,000, we found 3,000 stalls uh, run by uh, impoverished men and their whole families who actually contribute to the cooking and the selling. Uh, and they, uh, because, you know, it, it transpired that actually the Haryana government doesn't have the scientific equipment. Uh, that's something that the IISC can perhaps help them with if they choose. They don't have the scientific equipment to, uh, to actually make this very important distinction whether the, the meat was of a cow or a buffalo. But they still took the samples. And the reason was very clearly one to intimidate. The result of that was that uh, all of them closed down uh, the stalls, stopped selling biryani, became unemployed. And in Bakri, uh, which followed, uh, the, the sacrifice, almost 80% of the families were not, did not go in for sacrifice. And would people say this was the first time in their lives when they were too frightened. It's a poor place, so actually, they said, uh, uh, you know, s seven families actually combined uh, for, for buying one animal for sacrifice. And then that is divided up into seven parts, the meat of it, and that is divided into three parts. One is for the poor, one is for the family, and so on. So all of that ritual was finally, uh, no, they were too frightened to do this. Uh, another story. Uh, I was, you know, I work with homeless people, so just after, a few days after the demonetization uh, tsunami uh, hit uh, the poor in India, I wanted to understand what was happening in the lives of homeless people who I know actually have to, uh, th there's a mandi, a labor under uh, near Chani Chow, where they gather every morning at 6 and they wait for people to pick them up. And it's very exploitative work because they're really the weakest even among workers. Uh, and they have no bargaining power at all. And they're normally picked up for things like wedding uh, parties, etc. And this is the wedding season. But there was, you know, they said, you know, this is the high peak of the wedding season. So, I, you know, normally they'd have all got work, but most of them were still standing there very angry, very uh, disconsolate. Uh, but, uh, and they said, there's just no work, no one is picking us up. And uh, we are people who, uh, in, in the Hindi proverb, we, we uh, dig the well every day and, 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 and quench our thirst and we don't know what to do. Some 60, 70 of them were picked up by this one person and they also were enraged because they said, well, how did he get that much money in these times, uh, a very elaborate wedding. Uh, they have to work three nights, yeah, two nights and three days without sleeping more or less because that's how the wedding uh, cycle goes. At the end of that, they were given a uh, 500 rupee old note each and they had no power to bargain and they said you take it or leave it. They stepped out, they had to get onto a bus, they couldn't, the bus uh, driver didn't allow them. So they walked 15 kilometers to the pavements at, at Jami Masjid and Jami Chok where they sleep. Uh, they went to try to get some food at a dhaba, they were turned away. Finally, they had no option except to, uh, there were touts who had already emerged, who were buying the 500 rupees for 300 rupees, and that is what they finally were able to get. Uh, I also, we also worked with homeless women who were in begging, so I thought, let me go and see what is happening with them. When I went there, I was surprised to find that there were very few women uh, there. The few people there, of course, said that, you know, like everything else, no one was offering any uh, arms at all uh, uh, to the people who depended on begging. Uh, but they, they told me that uh, most of the women were not there. I said, where are they? They said, they are the bank. So I was very curious. Then I discovered that, you know, uh, we had, one of the things we had managed to get them were Aadhaar cards. And I never expected that there was this other opportunity that would arise. So they now have the, have the capacity to go and exchange old notes. So the touts recruit them to go and exchange 2,000 rupees uh, because they have an Aadhaar card. So I did a quick back of the envelope calculation. 
So if you're getting 200 rupees in every 500 rupees, so on 2,000 rupees you're earning 800 rupees. You pay 250 rupees to this woman to stand in line uh, all day. So you still make a, a neat packet of 550 rupees, which to my mind is clearly black money. Uh, so, uh, and then I was in rural India and I was again trying to, you know, I, I spent two days uh, traveling around the interiors of Odisha. And uh, the stories there were even more devastating. Uh, I don't have the time to relate to them, but uh, but the you know but to you know, I, I just keep thinking, what was the imagination of the people who made a policy where all they could think about the people of India for them were people who had who had plastic cards of some kind or had you know accessible bank accounts. Uh, you know, 80, 90 percent of the people who are outside it didn't even qualify in their calculations. So there was some inconvenience for us. We were standing long lines. Each of us, you know, will have our own stories of how we are struggling with this inconvenience. But the fact that for the large majority of Indians, you have dealt an extraordinary death blow to their very process of day-to-day -day survival, and there's no there's no end possible for it. You know, I, I, I have one cow, I sell milk, uh, I, there's no one who can buy the milk. Uh, I am a small farmer who employs workers, uh, but I can't, don't have cash to pay those workers, so my crop is standing. Uh, the workers who are dependent on me uh, are not getting any wages. And, you know, it's like they're telling me, me that this is like, a, you know, like the, those famines of old which are beginning to unfold created by a certain kind of public imagination of people who govern us. But it is, you know, it, I'm not just talking about the government, I'm talking about the large number of us who are endorsing this as an, an acceptable inconvenience. And if you're complaining about it, what about the soldiers in the front who are, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know or, or something like that. I think something, you know, these are, examples and uh, I, 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 you know, we'll talk a little more, but to my mind, something very fundamental has broken down in our society. And, and when I see uh, the election results in, in, in the US, I see what has happened in the UK, uh, I, I realize what is happening in France. Uh, actually, if you really look at the five, six, you know, uh, Security Council countries, uh, US, uh, UK, France, in fact the choice is between, I, I was told, uh, between right, more right and most right, uh, you know, there is no other choice, and Russia. And finally we have actually China left to defend some kind of liberal values uh, in the secure, Security Council. <laughs> this is where we are, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in the world today, so there's part of it a larger global turmoil and, and I wanted to reflect a little bit with you all in a language that scientists very rarely speak about, even social scientists very rarely speak about. I think what is really broken down is, is something that was so fundamental uh, in the imagination of our constitution. What were the four pillars of the constitution of India uh, written in? Justice, liberty, equality, and fraternity. And I think you know, all of these are threatened, but perhaps what I'm seeing most threatened is, is the least remembered and even less understood foundation uh, of our uh, constitutional values, and that was that is the idea of fraternity. And it is fraternity that is broken down in Nevath, it is fraternity that is broken down in, you know, in this measure that has, you know, uh, you know uh, dispossessed from just the most the minimal survival uh, millions of our poor people uh, in, in the context of, I mean, we are told that one of the workers was telling us, no, no, we understand this is for the good of the country, but it's not good for us, the poor. 
So as if the poor actually, are, he sees very clearly that the country is there and the poor are here in their sort of oppositional uh, frames. And the country doesn't include the poor at all. And, and, and in, in our imagination of governance, I think, there was a time I joined the IAS in 1980, even up to then, the purpose of government, the poor were the purpose of government, at least in theory. That is why you were there. I think with neoliberalism, the poor disappeared from our imagination. Uh, I call it the, you know, the exile of the poor from our conscience and our consciousness. But what I'm seeing now with the advancing of time, the poor are actually the problem to the country's development. You know, they're sitting on lands and they're making noise when you try to acquire their lands. They're, they are the ones who uh, you know, are, are, are complaining. You know, let them wait another three two, three decades when all of this wealth increases. One day they'll also be well off. And why are they so impatient today? And you know, you know, the demonetization thing is another reflection of this way that we have imagined the poor out of the country. Now, fraternity, uh, Dr. Ambedkar said something very, 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 very powerful about fraternity. And that was that it is only when there is fraternity that liberty and equality become the natural order of things. Please think about it. It is only if there is fraternity that liberty and equality are things that we believe other human beings living in our country deserve. Uh, you know, what we were hearing about why are we so, why is there no outrage at, uh, at the fact that, you know, children have such different destinies based simply on the accident of their birth. What is fraternity? Fraternity very simply, uh, you know, very literally means uh, brotherhood. Uh, and, and there's a problem with that word, but that, you know, we quickly resolve that by saying brotherhood and sisterhood. But, but, but the Hindi, uh, Hindi version of the constitution actually uses a lovely word for fraternity. Any of you? Bandhuta. Bandhuta. It's become one of my favorite words when I look at what is happening around me. What does Bandhuta mean? Bandhu in Sanskrit is really connectedness. Bandhu we also use for friend. Bandhuta is an ideology based on the understanding that we belong to and with each other. That, you know, and I think there are many sibling ideas of fraternity that I could talk about. Uh, I can talk about solidarity. Uh, I, I can talk about compassion, I can talk about empathy, I can talk about caring, I can talk about giving, I can talk about sharing, and I can talk ultimately about love as politics, love as the foundation of why we are together. And, and I think that most of all, uh, we have, we, 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 we rarely, we never perhaps as a society, had a sense of fraternity. Caste is the very antithesis of the idea of fraternity. Because caste is based on an idea that your birth legitimately determines the rest of your life. So in another institution, uh, not far from here, a PhD scholar uh, at the start of this year, when he took his life, he wrote a letter to the world, which he said was his first and last letter to the world. And he said in it that I could never escape the fatal accident of my birth. The fatal accident of my birth. I believe there is no more powerful uh, and penetrating uh, indictment of what we have accomplished and not accomplished in the 70 years of India's freedom than this one line. Uh, that, you know, we were talking about, you know, the, uh, the opportunities uh, of young people in universities and, you know, and different kinds of universities. Uh, actually, the number of people who complete graduation is only 7%. 
the number of women who complete graduation is 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 four percent. Dalits is four percent. Uh, rural people is supposed to be something like two to three percent. So, what is the life of young people who do not belong to this? What are they doing with their lives? Uh, Rohit Bengala also in his letter uh, spoke about uh, his dream, which would never be fulfilled, of becoming a science writer like Carl Sagan, uh, and uh, you know, and and and. Uh, the letter was sent actually to Carl Sagan's wife, who is still living, and she wrote back very movingly. She said that this letter is a reminder, one more reminder to the world of how much we are losing, uh, how much the world is losing in terms of just lost potential because of prejudice and discrimination. None of us are in this room because we deserve to be here. I am not here because I deserve to be here. You are not here because you deserve to be here. We are here because we chose our parents well. Uh, because uh, you know, if we had you know been a little more careless in that selection, you could have been the boy who was serving tea outside, someone on a construction site somewhere, someone in a brothel somewhere, a woman sleeping uh, uh, on the streets of of of, of Bangalore, uh, getting raped every night. There's no fundamental difference except the accidents, fatal or otherwise of our birth. And I think that we can deal with it ultimately in a framework of recognizing that that, that person who's sleeping on the streets also belongs to me and I belong to that person. The idea of solidarity, the idea of fraternity is something that we need to claim again. Instead, you know, going back to uh, the cow slaughter story, firstly, for instance, uh, you have a man who is attacked uh, on the on the assumption, on the rumor that he was uh, that he killed a cow, uh, and he's lynched to death. Some months later, the government actually does an inquiry into whether the meat in his refrigerator was cow or buffalo meat. Uh, at the end of which criminal cases are registered against the family of that man. One of the accused dies in, in prison, martyred actually only to a mosquito because he died of chicken dunya. But he was then draped in the national flag uh, in the presence of Union Home Minister and given a martyr send off. Uh, I was in, you know, I'm also working in uh, in Muzaffarnagar. Muzaffarnagar, uh, in few years ago, uh, a rumor that turned out to be false that that uh, that a Muslim boy was uh, pursuing a, a Hindu girl it led to. Uh, uh, it's a, it's a long story which I, uh, I, but basically again based on a whole set of false rumors circulated through internet and so on, it resulted in people turning on their neighbors. This this was a place which never had riots even during the partition. It never had riots after Babri Masjid. People, Hindus and Muslims, the Jats and the Muslims, had lived together with peace and love uh, till a week before. And then a rumor was was was, was created uh, about uh, Muslim boys being running after Hindu girls, etc. As a result of which, uh, their homes were attacked, and uh, uh, by their neighbors, fifty thousand people, seventy-five thousand people ran away from their homes, lived in camps for months and years, uh, uh, and. Up to now, and we just completed a, a study, I found 50,000 of them have never, not been able to return to their homes. And they're living in these small alternative settlements in, in the worst of conditions. And when, you know, I, I sit with them and ask them, why haven't you gone back to your village? They say, koi, koi bulai, to hum jai. Nobody has even come back. They've been neighbors for generations. Nobody has even come back and asked them, uh, to return home 
after violence for some for an incident that never happened. Uh, a young boy, uh, I called Rahim. I mean, he, he was 16 years at that time. He, he was describing to me. You know, he just he said, you know, he, he he was 16 at that time. He said he was in school. He had close dark friends. He doesn't know what happened. He doesn't know how this happened. But he's he said now they see what happens is that when you have, you've been thrown out of your home. You can't go back, you're living in camps. Finally, with whatever money they could raise, they bought a small piece of land in a Muslim majority village where they were, you know, they're at the periphery of it. Uh, they, they just somehow tried to rebuild their lives. No one cares. Now, this migration had led to some of these people having to move to, uh, uh, obviously, they moved to places which were Muslim majority. So there's a place called Kanda where some of these people moved. So an announcement was made that the, the, uh, the, the Hindu minority in Kanda village is facing great trouble because these Muslims have, have come and shifted here. Uh, as a result of which, uh, teasing of girls has increased. And therefore, this is a big crisis to, on which the Home Minister, National Home Minister intervened, the National Human Rights Commission intervened, and actually produced a report Echoing this, I went back. I found the total number of people who had been added were 300 people. Now, those 300 people who had come into that uh, 300 families, they had come into this place not because they loved to come to this place, but because they had been driven out. Our concern should have been the people who, you know, circumstances that they were driven out of their homes, not treating them as if they are the, uh, you know, they are the great liability that is, uh, you know, which is causing a threat to the poor Hindu majority. Uh, as a result of which, uh, and Mr. Rajnath Singh, the Home Minister, was there in his election campaign, and he said, okay, "This is, you know, this is terrible, and I'm making it." Kisne uh, ka uh, uh, This was his his statement to a set of people who've been internally displaced because of hate violence, and there is nothing in the police records in any case to show. In any case, if, if people are living together, there will be some boys who are Hindu boys who behave badly, there will be Muslim boys who behave badly. It will be surprising if they aren't. Uh, and and there will be good people in all communities. But the way this is being done, so, you know, I, I, I could go on and there isn't time to do that. Uh, you know, one more example is also, you know, uh, is, is about Kashmir itself. You can have many, we can have many debates about Azadi and Kashmir and whatever it is. But the fact is that uh, about a thousand boys have got, young boys have got blinded uh, because of pellet guns. And not only blinded, they're not talking very much, it also is uh, you know, directed at their, uh, at their groin as well as uh, at their eyes. Uh, now, we might say they're completely they're wrong, uh, they make things. But they, are they our children or are they not? And if your children, also you, you disagree with what your children do, what your younger brother does, or what your son has done, would you blind the person? And after he has been blinded, would you not care? Let me talk a little more about social policy. In social policy, because fraternity is important both with living, in the context of living with difference, but also in the context of living with inequality. And you talked about Myron Weiner, you know, he was just, he couldn't, he couldn't understand why are we just not making the public investments necessary uh, to ensure a decent uh, education for all. You can ask the same, same question of why are we not making the same investments with regard to uh, having hospitals where people can go or nutrition of people. India's tax to GDP ratio is one of the lowest in any comfortable country. India's performance in, in even battling hunger uh, has actually fallen. The Global Hunger Index said we were 83 in the year 2000 in the Committee of Nations. We are now 97 in these 16 years of, of, of globalization. All of it is actually ultimately uh, you know, a breakdown of this sense of solidarity that we have with each other. So I will want the best for my child. 
and I, it doesn't matter to me that just across the road from my home is another little girl, just my daughter's age, who is uh, you know, who's sleeping under the open sky, who perhaps be raped through the night, uh, who will never see the inside of a school. It doesn't matter to me. You know, a homeless woman, I was speaking to her last week when we created our first shelter, what has changed most in her life? She said, for the first time in 17 years, when I wake up, in the, when I put, close my eyes at night, I'm sure that by the morning, no one is going to leave. I don't even, you know, is, is that woman, do I have nothing to do with that woman? Uh, or, or is there a relationship? And that is really what, I, what, what I'm talking about when I talk about the failures of fraternity. The idea, ultimately, that we belong to and with each other. Noam Chomsky uh, said, what is social policy? He gave a definition for social policy. He said, that social, policy, uh, social protection is ultimately the idea that we should take care of each other. I, 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 I can't think of a better definition both of social protection and of fraternity. The idea that we should take care of each other. But he goes on to say that we are living in times when this is seen, this idea that we should take care of each other is seen as an extremely dangerous and subversive idea that should be crushed at all costs. And I find that in my own you know, personal public engagement, uh, this, this dilemma and predicament, because largely I am talking about compassion. But it's seen as some extremely dangerous Maoist left loony idea that needs to be, you know, you know, needs to be opposed and crushed and shouted down. I'm really talking about reflecting on a society where we care for each other, that we recognize that we belong with each other. And finally, let me just talk about my thoughts when Donald Trump got elected. Uh, because I think his politics represents in many ways the antithesis comprehensively of these ideas of fraternity that I'm speaking about. Uh, it, it was interesting, I, 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 I got messages from many friends who said they had gone into mourning. Uh, you know, they, they were in shock and they were in mourning. I, I thought back actually two and a half years ago when <laughs> Mr. Modi's election results came. Many of us who were, you know, had never believed that this was going to happen. This could happen in our country. Like the Americans could never believe that this would happen in their country. And, and, uh, and at that time also, people were, you know, almost, I, I got started getting phone calls from morning to night. And at one point I started laughing because it was like people ringing up on condolences. Like, you know, we're really sorry. And, you know. <laughs> so I, but, but the comparisons, there are many differences between the two leaders. But what I wanted to say is that what is common about them is about three things. The first is that they're dealing with an extremely profoundly divided country. Both, are, both these countries, I mean, the, their election reflects an extremely divided nation in both cases. So what, one, what a leader could do would be to try to heal those divides. But instead, uh, the divisions based on prejudice, what I find both these leaders are doing, their politics is based on preying on prejudice, reflecting that prejudice, uh, reproducing that prejudice, amplifying that prejudice, and ultimately legitimizing that prejudice. What I see them doing is, is, a, is, is an extraordinary moral inversion where now it's you know it's not the minorities who are who are persecuted, but the majority, whether it's a white majority uh, there or the uh, you know the upper caste uh, Hindu majority here, we are the persecuted, and the minorities are persecuting us. It's the blacks and Hispanics and migrants and, and so on there, and it is uh, you know the uh, the Muslim and the Dalit uh, you know uh, who is who is at the so called the cause of our problem. So the moral inversion is where, likewise, it's it's not it's, it's not the rich who uh, you know who are exploiting the poor. It's the poor who are you know parasitical on the rich who are you know, people like us. We work hard. We uh, uh, 
pay taxes, etc. The poor are just sort of guzzling subsidies and uh, you know not doing enough to pull themselves up and, and, and so on. So you, you created a discourse of this moral inversion. And, 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 uh, and as a result, minorities in both countries have begun to live with increasing fear. Uh, the story in Mewat is only one of millions that I can share with you of Muzaffar Nagar. And I, I was looking at the internet and I saw this really heartbreaking uh, letter that a, an African American journalist in the New York Times, I think of one of these, uh, had written to her parents. The moment the results came out, she wrote to her parents, be careful, you know, when you go to the grocery, keep low, uh, you might be attacked, etc. And my Muslim young colleagues tell me how, you know, they, the, the mothers continuously ringing up, it, don't let your beard grow, uh, don't go out at night, somebody might pick you up, uh, don't, you know. This sense that I cannot be myself and belong, is, is the India and the America and the world that we are creating. And I think therefore we need to reflect on what came to us as the, as, as the fundamental pillars of democracy, not just liberty, not just equality, but also fraternity, and understand what it means and understand its implications for the way we relate to difference and the way we relate to injustice the way we uh, relate to inequality, all of these have to be on the foundations of the idea of the Thank you. Thank you, Ashiman, for a very moving narration of the present day developments. Another important uh, speaker we have is uh, Professor uh, Dhruv Reina. Uh, Professor Dhruv Reina is a leading philosopher and historian of science. And he is best known for his work on domestication of science in colonial India and the uh, history of the of science. Currently, he is a professor of history of science education at the Jackie Rushen uh, Center for Education Studies in JNU. Uh, his basic training is in physics uh, from IIT Mumbai. And completed his doctoral studies in philosophy of science from the University of Gothenburg, Sweden. I now welcome Professor Trurena. I'd like to be brief, but I can. I thank the organizers of Concern for having invited me here. Uh, it's nice for me to be back in Bangalore. Um, you know, when, 20 years ago, I was associated with the People Science Movement in Karnataka. And uh, uh, when, when we organized a meeting, there would be 20 students in the hall uh, from the Institute of Science. And today, uh, it's a pleasure to see there are uh, a lot many more. Uh, yeah, um, I'd like to talk about, I mean, I was given a title which was decolonization. But I'd like to raise the issue of, well, heritage and commoditization on the one hand, and the larger question which has come up in the talks of all the speakers before me from Shubhankar onwards, namely the issue of democracy. And I think that the issue of democracy in science and democracy in society uh, today uh, is a very major issue. Uh, yeah, now if you go back to the history of the All India People Science movements, the, the People Science movements arose in some sense if you talk of the Kerala Shastra Sahitya Parishad, they arose with an attempt to within quotes, democratize science. So what do we mean when we say that the attempt was to democratize science? The larger feeling was that the benefits of science were not percolating down to the people. The benefits of science were basically 
filtering down, but they were filtering down, you know, I mean, just to a wafer thin uh, layer, which uh, whose thickness uh, Aman Madan has told us about. But they were going to, so in other ways, if science was a common good, then why was it not available to everybody? And part of the reason arose from the fact that there was inequality in Indian society. Inequalities of many forms, some of them arising from illiteracy. And so it was felt that people must take them out of their lives and the people science movement at the time decided to take with it both science to the people. This was the phase of what you might call the popularization of science. The understanding was that this new knowledge, this critical consciousness would percolate down to people and they would be, they would probably play uh, or probably be able to play a more participative role in the construction of their lives uh, and the construction of their lives in what so many systems down to the functioning of healthcare systems and a number of other things. Uh, however, in the interim years, there was a tragedy, I think most of you here may not have been born in that year, I don't know. It was called the Bhopal gas tragedy. And this was a big setback in some sense for the democratic spirit of science. And so a big jatha was organized which triggered off a number of people science movements in many parts of the country where, you know, Kerala, Maharashtra, Bengal, yeah, there were already people science movements there. Was there anything in Haryana? Was there anything in Himachal Pradesh? No. So this became a movement to trigger off these people science movements in these countries but gradually the understanding arose that, well, the, the benefits of science cannot percolate down as long as people are not educated. Because science is a particular kind of knowledge and people have to know how to read and write. And at that point, a certain, a certain group in the leadership of the AIPSNs decided that, all right, we should embark on the literacy program. A number of other things happened. And there were those who said that, yeah, but what about rural livelihoods? What about technologies for the people that enable them to cope with their everyday lives in the rural areas, be it Karnataka or be it anywhere else? So as Ashubhankar said, I mean, all along, the priorities of the All India People Science Network have been changing in a way, responding to perceived, not real, but perceived needs by the movement of what is needed within society. All right, and so in a way, I feel, I'm really happy that, you know, the AIPSN has taken upon its job, and it's nice to talk about diversity in the Center for Ecological Studies, has taken upon itself the task of, I mean, dealing with, engaging with, reflecting upon the notions of diversity, inequality, and also inclusiveness. All right. If you go back, and that's a course I teach. If you go back to the history of the of the university, the 1950s was a particular turning point. The university, not just in India, the world over, was quite an elitist place in 1950. In India, it was probably more elitist than anywhere else, but it was an elitist place. In the 1950s, what we see is the emergence of the mass university. Right? And here it begins the kind of, within quotes, I mean people sarcastically refer to it, is the massification of the university. If so many people are going to come into the university, then uh, are you going to produce good students? No, you can only produce good students if there are 20 people in a classroom. Right? However, this moment is important for another reason. And it's important for another reason because in the developing countries, this decade is a decade of decolonization. It's a decade where countries in Africa, in the Arab world, in many parts of Asia are throwing off the yoke of colonial rule. Right? And so what happens is we see an alignment of two trajectories as far as South Asia is concerned. The trajectory of the alignment of, the, of, of decolonization with the rise of the massification of the university. And since then, if you go along and look at the long debates which have taken place around the massification of the university, the discussion on affirmative action, there has always been a dichotomy 
which has defined the debate. And the dichotomy that is defined in the debate is manifest in a tension between merit and social justice. And there are those who say that if you embark on the trajectory of social justice, merit will suffer. But if you look at the work of those who, who study education, who look at social justice, for them there is no tension between social justice and merit. Without delivering on social justice, you cannot, I assure you, you cannot deliver on merit. And without having some idea of merit, you cannot deliver on social justice. Right? These are two issues which are, are, are deeply related. And I think uh, today, if the university is under threat, and it's not under threat just in India, and I think this is also something which all of us share, that is there a political crisis in India? Or is there a global crisis? And I think there, there are both. And when Ahmad Madan made the plea that we have to set up networks outside the networks of power, I think then we have to forge alliances with others outside the nation. Because up to the 1950s or 1950s or 1980s, the university was the site for producing a kind of people who would help in building the nation. Today the university is no longer that. It's no longer that in the sense of it is that but it is also something else. And that something else it is, is that it is producing a manpower for a global economy. A manpower for a globalized, a connected world. In this globalized and a connected world, what we are beginning to see ironically is that the more globalized we get, the deeper, the more violent are the problems related to questions of identity. It's a challenge. And we have to understand why this is so. Why in, in this moment of intense globalization, probably the most intense in the history of mankind. I'm not one of those who believe globalization started now. I think globalization started a very long time back, many centuries ago. But in our own age, globalization takes place at an exceedingly rapid rate. All right. So why is it in this moment of globalization are we confronted with so much ethnic conflict? Why are we confronted with so much violence? And I think this has to do with the fact that with globalization, with a particular kind of globalization, what has also happened is inequalities have grown. Inequalities have grown exceedingly rapidly. And because of the growth of these inequalities, we see that People find shelter increasingly in their ethnic identities, caste identities, and a number of other identities. All right. So this brings me to the second point. What is then a consequence of the rise of this politics of identity, or the politics of language, or the politics of any of these things? So I am a historian and philosopher of science, and. Yeah, I, mean, I study all kinds of abstract and not so abstract problems. But what has always bothered me is that when we talk in the history of science, I mean, somehow the question of heritage has become very important. All right, there was quantum mechanics in the Vedas. In the Islamic world, oh, we developed all the technologies that everybody talks about. All right, and so there's a problem there. What's the genesis of that problem? The genesis of the problem is that there is a certain pathology of colonial societies. In this pathology of colonial societies, if you were living in the late 19th century, colonial education most likely would have told you, you want science, you are not capable of science. We have a great tradition of the history of science. All right? And if you go back to the struggles which took place between 1870 and 1890, when Indians fought to establish a scientific system, you can also then begin to say that at the cultural level, more and more Indians began to assert that we had, we too had a scientific tradition. All right. Now, how does this go? There were many ways of looking at it. One of my favorite actors in the story is somebody who is called the father of chemistry in modern India, Acharya Prafulla Chandrare. Acharya Prafulla Chandrare. He writes an article in 1917. He says, you know, today is the birthday of some of our heroes like Shivaji and others. 
But today is also the birthday of Mendeleev. And I want to celebrate the birthday of Mendeleev. Today, if Acharjo had said that, there would have been a hundred people at his house. And this brings us precisely to the point that Harsh was raising. That we have lost the ability to be tolerant. We have lost the ability to engage with, to entertain, and to discuss different points of view. All right? And without discussing these different points of view, let me assure you, knowledge cannot grow. All right? Polemic, debate, skepticism is essential to the growth of all, all knowledges. You all are students here. You sit in a classroom. Somebody is presenting a paper. And at the back of your mind, what are you doing? This guy must be wrong. Either, you know, that data is not properly seen. There's something wrong with the calculation. Are the experiment? That is part of the value system of science, this organized skepticism. If we don't have that, you can't do science. Critique is essential to the growth of any kind of knowledge. And if we lose this value in science, what kind of knowledge will we produce? Today you tell me egg shampoo is good for my hair, and tomorrow you tell me peach shampoo is good for my hair, and egg shampoo is not. There must be some, some, some norm through which we arrive at a conclusion jointly, what is robust knowledge? So when I come back then to the question of identity and the question of centrism. So when people from the former colonies, people from the developing world began to look back at their past, they wanted to produce a new story. They wanted to produce a story which would deliver what my friend, the sociologist of science, Shri Vishwanathan, calls cognitive justice. Please, into your histories of knowledge, accommodate our stories as well. Not everything happened in the year. All right? And this is a struggle which has been going on. But which are the directions in which we can go? I, in my own work, and a number of others, have preferred to go in the long, another direction. And this is something which I've been discussing with one of the members of the AIPSN in, uh, in New Delhi, Tira All right, so for the sake of cognitive justice, we go back and say, well, in India we had this mathematical tradition, and in India we had this, and we, in India we had that, etc. We go on and on and on. But the thing about knowledge is knowledge circulates. Knowledge moves around. An algorithm is produced in China in the 2nd century BC, travels to India in the 1st century BC, travels into the Arab world in the 8th century AD. And every time it moves, it becomes version 1, version 2, version 3, version 4 of that algorithm. Because wherever it goes, somebody tinkers around with it, puts a twist on it, elaborates upon the algorithm. It travels around. In the 17th century, the algorithm comes back to China. The Chinas can't recognize it because this is not the same equation. It's probably a far more elaborate and a far more developed equation than it was when it started out in China, but it is part of the history of the evolution of that equation. So civilizations and cultures have always been intact and knowledge has been moving around. Can you ascribe a national identity to them? What is the identity of the Siberian crane? Is it Siberian or is it Bharatpur? <laughs> Please tell me. <laughs> Alright, so ideas travel around, and when they travel around, they, I mean, you know, there's a beautiful story told about uh, uh, Lobashevsky. There's a field of geometry called, I mean, the mathematicians here, uh, Riemannian geometry. Alright, Riemann is in touch with the network of scholars, and he has the credit for inventing Riemann geometry. Paul Lobashevsky, working all alone in some corner of Russia, not in touch with anybody. It was a luck. Right? So ideas are like capital. They develop, they move, they evolve as long as they're moving around. Right? And therefore my argument would be, and I've had a lot of argumentation, I talked for at least an hour today at NCBS on this, is that yes, there was Eurocentrism. But what is the answer to Eurocentrism? Is it we, we Indians did it before you? Is it we, we Muslims did it before you? Is it we, we Chinese did it before you? Even logically, is the answer to one centrism another centrism? It can't be. It can't be. The answer to centrism, and what is the problem with centrism? Because centrisms are prejudiced. 
all right? And in the world of knowledge, they carry the same prejudices, the same kinds of prejudices and essentialization of the other that caste prejudices carry. I am greater than you. All right? I, I, ha I have a friend, I mean, okay, I'll come back to that later. So, my claim, as somebody who does history and philosophy of science, is that there is no civilizational exceptionalism. Every civilization is equally great. Every culture is equally great. Within that framework, you then have to develop a theory for the circulation and evolution of knowledge. And that theory for the circulation and evolution of knowledge cannot be a theory which is founded on any centrism. All right? And if you found it on any centrism, let me assure you, it's not going to be a knowledge at all. You're going to land up with the same problems, uh, problems as the criticism which we as scholars uh, accused Eurocentrism of. So we need another framework. However, there's another problem, and this again is coming up again. Amal raised neoliberalism, uh, Harsh raised neoliberalism, Shubhankar raised neoliberalism. There is, within the theories of knowledge, a certain kind of, how shall I say, commitment, two commitments. One, that knowledge grows in the ideas of men. Individuals sitting isolated in their in their in their laboratories, men of genius who come up with. Alright. And those who study the sociology of science will tell you no, knowledge is something social. Alright? It's part of a network. It's like language. Does language belong to any of you? Knowledge is also like that. So let me take the story of Ramanujam. No, everybody says Ramanujam is a genius. No, he, yeah, he was a genius. But somebody had to recognize he was a genius, right? And the person who has to recognize as a genius must have some sensibility, he must understand that mathematics to know he is a genius. So that knowledge is not just Ramanujan's. Okay? So if you go back into the theory of knowledge, if you look at all the debates on intellectual property, the underlying premise is this individualism, the underlying premise is that history confers rights. I had it before you and I have a right to claim a patent. Alright? So within the world of knowledge then, we see we are trapped between these two problematics. The problematic of the identity of knowledge forms and the problematic of the, 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 the question of patenting or rights about knowledge. Are they common rights or are they rights for everybody? You know, I mean, somebody in England went and claimed a, a patent for chicken tikka masala. You say, ah, I mean, what is that? I mean, how can you claim a patent? But you've done it. The same idea is at stake. Right? And so, if you go back then at the next point, today you will see a big discussion. And over here, I'd like to bring in also the question of equality. There's a big discussion on indigenous knowledge. In UNESCO's document, it is now put that, well, we have the problems of sustainable development and the problems of sustainable development cannot be solved by science alone. We have to engage with the knowledge of indigenous peoples. So they call it indigenous and local knowledge and why local? It's, a, it's another question. Now, I begin to ask myself what is indigenous knowledge? In a globalized world, a world which was globalized you know, a long time ago when knowledge was passing around between the grand civilizations. I mean, uh, you begin to say, well, uh, what is indigenous? The indigenous doesn't make stand uh, claim. However, there are throughout the world, whether in Australia, whether amongst the Santhals in Madhya Pradesh, whether amongst the Todas in the Nilgiri Hills, there are communities which have never been part of this global circulation of knowledge. In the debate in India, on indigenous knowledge, and this is something I've written about. I mean, if you're interested, I can certainly do with you. In the debate in India, the entire discourse of indigenous knowledge is captured by the high caste traditions. Ayurveda, Jyotisha. Hey, what about the knowledge of that Santhal? That is also knowledge. They have also survived for centuries. Is that not part of indigenous knowledge? All right? And so, but, and I mean, you know, one of the, I don't know how many, must be many biologists, agriculturists here. I mean, one of 
the great area where a lot of work is going to take place in the near future. You know, the crisis we are in agriculture is soil science. And in soil science, I mean, uh, traditional peoples who not interact with each other have a lot of knowledge about soil science. Should not that be part of our, part of the heritage? Which heritage? So these are issues which I think are going to animate us and are going to uh, be part of our discussion of the future. And our defense is always going to be, can only be, on the grounds of diversity. The, the, the second and, <coughs> no, it's the third, right? Heritage, oh, okay, a commoditization when I talk to property rights. And the third issue is the question of democracy. Now, in 1930s, an American philosopher called John Dewey believed that in the refereeing system of science, in the practice of science, we had a model of democratic politics. All right? That, all right, I am now 57 years old, I write a paper, I send it to a journal, it goes through a procedure of anonymous refereeing. If the paper is crap, it will be rejected, irrespective of what my standing is. All right? And in like manner, there are many, 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 many norms which we seem to think as democratic. If I go back to the history of science, with the rise of the revolutionary movements, there is a concurrent rise of a democratic consciousness and the practice of science. And so people say, science is democratic. And when I look at science over the last 50 years or the 60 years, you know, science has been in bed with the military, science has been in bed with all kinds of industrial lobbies, that it has distorted the norms of science. And today we live in a world, if you go to some of the CSI labs and you go to the other people, you see directors who are extremely authoritarian, exceedingly authoritarian. And you say, where is the democratic norm of science? Can science provide a model today for democratic politics? No, I don't think so. So, if we have to wage a larger struggle for things like against uh, exclusion, against inequality, I think that in the interest of science, one also has to now defend democracy within science. And if you don't, I mean, and we've seen this again and again and again. You go to the, you go to Russia at the time of Lysenko, you go to uh, Germany during the Nazi period, or you go anywhere in the world. Lack of democracy is bad for science itself. And you will be able to see it even in your own laboratory context. You will see it in your own laboratory context. I mean, just imagine you're working in a lab and you're not sharing data with everybody else. Just imagine you're working in a lab and, you know, I mean, your faculty member teaches you like a few or not. Would it be actually good for science? How is democratic communication within science following? I mean, in principle, you as a student can shoot down my theory. In the absence of a democratic environment, would that be possible? All right. And so what I think is, okay, uh, it's time for me to wind up. Yeah. And so what I think today is that I've been telling my friends that if I look at the way some of our labs are going today, uh, they suffer from a total absence of democratic norms. There's a great deal of, uh, you know, scientists are demoralized. And so you begin to wonder, is the scientific personality authoritarian? Basically, is the practitioner of science not democratic? Right? This is something I'd like to work on, because when I look at many of the laboratories, you know, I, mean, I don't agree with Shubankar when he says rocket science is bad science. No, I mean, you know, that's too simple for me. But what I can see in, in Shubankar saying is that within the realm of rocket science, or what is the way rocket science is practiced in India, is a lack of a democratic culture. And this democratic culture is closely tied up with the practice, with the practice of diversity. They go together. It's not possible, it's not possible to keep them apart. I, I shan't uh, proceed any further, I'd set myself for 20 minutes. And, uh, thank you very much.
Thank you, Professor Trubrina. Shall we, I mean, the session is open for uh, question. Yeah, of course, we are running out of time, but still, let's have. societies cannot be diverse. That's the argument. Diversity is, 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 is respecting difference. Uh, diversity, to my mind, is the ability to respect difference. And I don't like the word tolerance. Many of us don't like it because tolerance means I'm putting up with, uh, with some of these different there's no question of putting up, and this question of actually uh, understanding, respecting, uh, and, and so on. And I think that you know, there's a great deal that we can learn from you know, the practice of people like Mahatma Gandhi and, uh, and Mohan Azad, because these are two people who were deeply devout in their own faith, and were extremely respectful of other faiths as well. And it wasn't an either or. It's interesting that the two people who actually fought for the religious state most Jinnah and, uh, and uh, uh, Savarkar were both non-practicing. They were not practicing in their own faiths. They fought for a religious state. The people who practice religion respected others. So it's about much more than... And exclusion means is just a recognition of the fact that it's not... It just doesn't happen that you are in the margins. You are pushed to the margins. No, I had a couple of uh, questions actually to each of you, uh, on each to Ashwanda uh, Um I started out to say something, I'll say it right this time. I, I you know, you, you sort of towards the end of your presentation talked about the idea of compassion as something that has been lost. But um, I, I mean, one way of looking at a lot of sort of uh, uh, Sort of debate in society is also to, to uh, I mean, compassion often doesn't arise as a, as a notion that's relevant, but a notion of justice and what is right is, is what a lot of uh, public. Uh, but this also seems to have been uh, somehow not very uh, prevalent, and what seems to have taken the place of the centrality of a notion of justice. Is, is a notion of injustice that has been done to you, right? And, 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 and uh, uh, you know, I. But but what I would like you to comment on is 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 the the extent to which one must address that. I, I think uh, you know, some of the commentary about like Trump that you spent some time talking about has focused on the fact that. You know, whether the perspective of origins is right or not, there is, right or wrong, there is a certain um, uh, sort of a grievance that, that, that is real. Um, so that, that's the question too. Maybe I, I, I'll just only mention quickly what I wanted to talk but maybe there's no time for it. But I think in terms of your comments about the scientific enterprise, I guess one way of Talking about it is whether the scientific enterprise has become oppressive to the practitioners and, and, and sort of ask about why 
that has become so rather than a liberating experience, which is what you sort of learn it's supposed to be in here in school and get excited about. Very briefly, uh, when I talk about compassion, I, I'm really talking about something that I described uh, in, in my writing as egalitarian compassion. It's a compassion between equals. It's a recognition uh, that you're not down here and I'm here, but that we are together and you just had a very hard life and, uh, you know, and, and therefore I care. So it's, it's a certain framework which we call empathy, called solidarity, as well, called it. But the linking with justice is very critical. And here I just, uh, Amartya Sen in his book, The Idea of Justice, towards the end, actually, it's not the central thesis, but towards the end, he makes very, us a very interesting question. He says that injustice is characteristic of every human society through history and through the world. But so has, another thing is also universal, which is the resistance to injustice, is also universal to the human experience. And he asked why. And I, I really love his answer, and I think there's a lot that one needs. He said there are three qualities, and it links up with a lot of things that you know, uh, also spoke about. Uh, he said the first is the quality of empathy, the, the ability to feel another, imagine and feel another person's pain. He said the second is the is is, is, the, is, is the capacity of reasoning, of reason. So the scientific question: Why? And the third is the love of freedom. And he says that it is, it is because human nature comprises of these three capacities of, you know, of, of empathy, of reasoning, and of, uh, of, 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 of the love of freedom that fighting injustice is universal. So therefore, I believe that empathy and justice are very close to that. Uh, coming to uh, <coughs> Srikant's question. No, I, thought, I thought I made the point that in a way, over the past 60 years, science has lived too close to very strange values from 1940 onwards. Right? It's lived with, it's been, <coughs> it's lived close to the military, it's lived close to the state. And when the state is drawing, Belong to, belong, this is very close to corporate interests. Uh, my feeling is that in this in this transition, and this is something I pointed out in, in an article I wrote some time back, and even somebody like C. V. Raman uh, notes it that uh, there has been not just an epistemic drift in our ideal of knowledge, all right, but uh, more than anything else, there is a distortion of the value system. So, yeah, so, yeah. I mean, we are not in disagreement, but, yeah. question just raised about uh, uh, compassion. See, um, uh, a pattern which I observe in Trump's and many others' arguments is the idea that because I have been wrong, or I believe I have been wrong, it is all right for me to no longer practice a lot of things which other people think is decent behavior. This argument and this pattern I see again and again in many things. This is also part of what is often called the politics of rage. Therefore, uh, which sometimes works also, uh, which which uh, gives energy and great uh, enthusiasm to protest. Uh, the criticism of this is that this is a false argument. That because I have been wrong, therefore I need not concern myself with everything else. You know, I can say whatever I like about Mexicans, about Muslims, or anything. This by itself is a wrong argument. Uh, I was just pointing out that the idea of injustice done to you tends to be a commitment to the idea of justice. That's a very nice point. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> so, I don't need my uh, My question is related to education. Uh, there are uh, much debates upon... Uh, there are much... 
there are much debates upon um, rates of return of for primary education versus rates of return to higher education. And uh, there has been studies which tell that the rates of return to primary education exceed <coughs> that of higher education. Uh, Indian government, uh, of course, it's been a long time since we are focusing on, like, right education is passed, and we are focusing on uh, spreading primary education to people. But at the same time, Indian government is, uh, has been thinking about uh, withdrawing subsidies from higher education. So how far this is justified? <coughs> One common uh, error which takes place in conversations about rates of return uh, is, is that rate of return is calculated on the basis of amount of investment made. Now, this is so when you say this to uh, an economist, uh, it is it seems to it doesn't seem to make much of a problem because the rate of return yes for uh, higher education the profit you get on investment over there is less as a percentage according to certain methodologies of calculating this for primary education. However, the overall return for higher education is much much higher than primary education. So these are contradictory signals, uh, which is part of what one has also to look at when one is talking about this issue. Very different uh, results can return, can come from both these two different ways of looking at things. This is one thing. But with that, there is another, there are two other dimensions of this at least. One is it is true that elites across the world cornered resources for themselves and were unwilling to share them with the others. Which is why you would find huge amounts of investment going into higher education of very questionable value. Uh, uh, I, my physicists will forgive me, but I, I was once hearing from a friend about some great international experiment being done, uh, which had a budget of something like five billion dollars. So for the life of me, I couldn't understand how is this priority decided? Five billion dollars for a very esoteric experiment to discover a new particle which nobody knows and nobody really knows whether they find it out. Whereas people, other people in the world are starving. Uh, I mean, this is not to say that that experiment is not important. But these are also questions. How do you decide? And the role of elites in gathering resources is very questionable, which is a second and an important thing to keep in mind. How much money does the government spend on the education of the poor? How much does it give further to the rich so that they can get even richer through higher education. It's an important question. The, uh, the answer to that cannot be to kill universities. A bit of history on this. World Bank went around saying this at one point of time, exactly this argument, uh, that uh, we are uh, pampering the rich by giving subsidies to higher education instead of put that money into primary schooling. Much later, uh, which I really I doesn't remember, much later they said, oh, sorry, we made a mistake. Why? If you destroy higher education, if you make higher education only uh, something which people will do because you can get a profit out of it, then higher education only certain kind of knowledge, kinds of knowledge prosper. Other kinds of knowledge which are very important for society, but you can't make a profit out of it, don't prosper. Much later we have World Bank document say, oh sorry, sorry, we made a mistake. That means if you make higher education something where only profit has to be concentration, that means studies like, how do you help the poor? Nobody will study that question. How do you understand patriarchy? Nobody will study that question. So uh, this is actually bad for a society. If we allow higher education to, to, to disintegrate, and only those parts of higher education which somebody, which some corporation will hire a person from, uh, for uh, having gotten, only those things should uh, operate. That also doesn't work. So the, so the, the direction to take perhaps, one, certainly one has to rethink the, uh, the privileges which the elites have in higher education, definitely. And to ask how much, how do you really redistribute these resources? But the answer cannot be to take a profit motive, you know, which is how too much of the discussions on rate of returns operate. Instead one has to ask what is good for society? From the point of view of what is good for society, how does one distribute resources? Maybe a better direction to take. So, uh, due to time constraints, let us uh, conclude the uh, discussion uh, point.
us thank all the four uh, speakers who could make their time and